Every entrepreneur has a story. Welcome to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur, where each episode, your host, Brian Carney, will share a drink with a successful business owner and have them discuss their unique journey, gaining insight on what it takes to be an entrepreneur and the different ways to get there. Brian isn't just a beer nerd. He's also the co-founder of Rivers Edge Advisors, a financial planning firm headquartered in Delaware, specializing in working with business owners. It's time to pour yourself a drink and enjoy a happy half hour with an entrepreneur. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur. I am your host, Brian Carney. My guest today is Lauren Owens, the founder of Tiny Onion Chef Services. She worked in a number of different jobs in the restaurant industry before starting her own business in 2017. And her favorite slogan happens to be, eat your veggies. Lauren, thank you so much for joining me today. Hi, how are you? Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to talk to you. I'm always excited to talk about food. Awesome. Me too. Okay, great. So for, uh, for, the, for this episode, I'm actually going to be drinking a beer from one of my favorite breweries, which is Trogues in Hershey, Pennsylvania. It's called Lucky Holler. So I'll give it a rating at the end. I know you awesome. don't drink, so what are you what are you going to be trying on? I don't drink, but I bought um, this really cool. I've been into this one company called Rally Mermaid, and they do like kombuchas and these different immunity to- um, tonics and stuff like that. So mine is a matcha uzu, and uh, I'll be having that. So it's got like reishi mushrooms in there and stuff like super mm. great. Should give you a lot of energy and like a lot of good antioxidants and stuff. Much healthier than than the beer, that's for sure. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> All right, great. Well, let's start. Tell us a little bit about your business. Okay, so my business, I am an in-home personal chef. I am a trained chef by um, trade and spirit, but I, um, for my business, I go into homes and I do cooking classes, meal prep. I basically bring the restaurant and the experience to you into your homes. That's pretty awesome. So how do you even come up with this idea to, to start this as a business? So I've been cooking my whole life and I've been in restaurants and hotels um, my whole life. And about four years ago, I decided to, you know, jump into my own business. I say, you know, jump into the ocean of freedom and I didn't have authorities, but (laughs) so my end game, (laughs) my end game always was to have my own shop and where I can do everything I love inside that shop. So everything local, celebrate local artisans and farmers, do cooking classes, have some meal prep available, like a little cafe meets bookstore and kind of maybe had an affair with like a local grocery shop. Yeah. <laughs> so, and that would be called the tiny onion. And so in between that, when I left my last job where I was the executive chef, and I, like I said, I didn't have any floaties, I decided to build my own business as a personal chef as like in between the two. Um, Cause I wasn't quite ready to open up a real t- retail shop. Right. So I decided to do everything that I'm good at. And that's just bring all that I have into your home to the, the client and build relationships that way. Yeah. And it's actually yeah. been really well and been going very well. And I'm a little bit, I mean, in hindsight, it's 2020. I'm happy that I didn't open up a shop uh, when I left the restaurant in 2017, because the whole pandemic and 2020, everything happened. And, you know, God bless the people that were still uh, able to stay open, but it was very hard for them. And sure. So still hard for me because I was an in-home business and service. And there was a time where like, we weren't sure if we should be going into homes and all sure, the things. Yeah. Um, I had built enough traction that my clients really rallied behind me and we just pivoted a little bit. I did a lot of Zoom things, a lot of drop-offs and it all just happened. And then the summer hit and people were ready to like go outside and have outdoor parties. And like I said, I adjusted my business model the best I could and kept it rolling. So that's great. Yeah. So the, the restaurant industry is just a infamously brutal business, right? So you got your, you, you got your start in this sort of a, well, at first a sub shop, right? Yes. That's great. <laughs> yes. My, my first job was at a sub shop on the corner of my street in Metuchen called someplace better. They actually just closed um, right in 2020, like right uh-huh. in the, the pandemic and not because of it, but the owner was just ready to give it. Okay. To, yeah. But um, yeah, so that was my very first job. So so from there, you go sub shop, then, then, then take us on the, the, how your the trajectory of your career from there. So sub shop, 
still was just like a job for me. Like I loved pickles. They had the best pickles. And I was like, George, I need these. I need to have pickles, like all the time. So he was like, well, you can come slice them. So I was still too young to like use the slicer. So I wasn't making the sub sandwiches, but I would dress them and I was able to use the grill cashier a lot. I was a dishwasher, made yeah. tuna, things like that. So um, I didn't know that I wanted to be in the business then, but boy, did it kind of like set me up to do so. Um, and then in high school, so I was still young now. I was like 14, 15 years old uh, working at the sub shop. In high school, I had a cooking class and my cooking teacher, I took great notes. I wasn't really the best student in all my other classes, but I mean, when you think about it, how all these steps lead me to where I am now, I was right. really great at my class. I took amazing notes. My teacher used my notes. She kind of took me under her wing. Um, she really kind of fostered the love that I had for the class and for learning. And, it, and she had this like fair, this... Um, college fair and at the time I had no idea like where I was going to go to college or what I was even going to do like my grades were not fabulous they were average I had to work like super hard to get them like C's sure um and she had this college fair and all these cooking colleges were there like CIA and Johnson and Wales and I'm like like there's a college just for cooking and I'm like <laughs> My family is like a whole line of home cooks and they love to cook. And I always cooked as a chore and helped my dad out and sat up underneath my grandmother and everything. So I just felt like that was just something you do. I never looked at it as a career. Like we have to eat, you know? Sure. Um, and I was good at it, but I didn't realize that I was, it didn't seem like the good was any, any merit to it. I was just, you know, it kind of didn't click right away. But when I was like, Oh, you can go to college for it. So I, um, decided that I was going to Johnson and Wales. I told everybody I was going to Johnson and Wales, but then when I told my father I was going to Johnson and Wales, he had a different idea where <laughs> I was going. So I ended, up, um, I ended up going to Middlesex County College. I earned my associate's degree in applied science of culinary arts. And there, that's when it clicked for me. Um, it clicked probably that I knew I was going to be a chef in a particular class called Garmage. Yeah. Fancy for a keeper of the cold kitchen. And the teacher there, um, he was an adjunct teacher of that class, and he was an executive chef at the Hilton Short Hills. Mm -hmm. So at the end of every class, he chose two students to be externs at the Hilton Short Hills. Oh, cool. And I didn't get picked. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I, know, I didn't get picked. But he had then, but the cool thing was is that he hired me. So the thing about being externs is you don't get paid. Um, but he hired me. He, like, I was so bummed. I'm like, oh, I didn't get picked for this. I worked so hard to get picked. And then he pulled me aside. He was like, I'm going to hire you. So I got hired right out of college I had to work at the Hilton Short Hills. And I took a job in the garmage section there. Um, met a great friend of mine who became a, a like, you know, she took me under her wing, Sheila Sharon. I, that was a big, huge job for me. I was there for about five years. And worked my way around that kitchen, ended up in the dining room where um, that's kind of where everybody wanted to end up in that in that kitchen. Um, so it was like the Five Diamond restaurant and the only Five Diamond restaurant in the Five Diamond Hotel in New Jersey at the time. Oh, wow. They since lost their diamonds, but it was like the place to work. So um, I worked my way up around there. That was an interesting thing. I was the only woman there uh, in that kitchen, not in the whole kitchen of the Hilton, but uh, in the dining room, I was the only woman um, for quite a while and um, very cool experience. And let's see, oh, I skipped over, did I skip over something? I did, I skipped over Charlie Brown's, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I did my externship at Charlie Brown's. I did because I didn't get hired as an extern at the Hilton. I did through, through college, um, my two years at Middlesex, I worked at the um, Charlie Brown Steakhouse and I was the line cook there. Also the only woman and only American on the line, another, tough stint. Um, but I, I got my line chops there. Like yeah. I started off as a hostess and the, the chef came out and he was like, you, you going to school to be a chef? And I'm like, I am. And he goes, and he used some colored language and he goes, <laughs> why the heck are you out here? And I'm like, probably because you scare me. Um, <laughs> I stayed as a hostess for a while. And he was like, no, you need to be in the kitchen. So he hired me as a prep cook. And I worked on Saturdays and Sundays mornings as a prep cook then did doubles and worked as a hostess at night. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was grueling, but awesome. Um, but then finally the chef was like, I need you back here full time. So I became a, a line cook and I was on the line. Again, only woman, first woman, I think, in Charlie Brown's in the whole restaurant chain. Um, you know, that's not amazing. Written, not written in stone anywhere, but that was the rumor at the time that I was the, the, first, the first chick on the line. So that was pretty cool. Again, that was probably 
that was a tough job that because I really didn't know anything about restaurants yet. And I kind of just got thrown in. I mean, I was making, you know, coconut shrimp in the back. And then now I'm cutting the prime rib and cooking the things on the line. And that was like a big deal. So I learned a lot there. And it is a chain, but they did everything from scratch. And the chef really, again, I've been lucky. Like I had some really amazing chefs and people in my life. He took me under his wing. I mean, he showed me everything. They made all the soup from scratch and the sauces. I learned a lot there. That's and great. that's what I to the Hilton, um, but still got my butt kicked there too. It was a whole nother level of cooking and learning and kitchen. It was like a lot more professional and just intense. So yeah, it um, seems so like, that- it seems like your career path, you've for lack of a better term, had to pay your dues along the way until you, you know, you got, you worked your way up and then you're like, okay, I'm going to go leave and do my own thing. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty much what my whole career was about. I mean, the sub shop, you know, doing dishes, mixing tuna fish, slicing pickles, went out to the, to the um, Charlie Browns. I started off like deveining shrimp and all sorts of things, getting kind of knocked around a little bit. The Hilton, I had to really, I, I got good at the Hilton, but when I moved to the dining room, I really had to prove myself. I had to like, work extra hard to show that like I was worth having a spot on the line there. Yeah. Um, and uh, that happened. And then I left the Hilton. I was there for about five years. And then I went to the city for a little while and worked under another good friend of mine, Abby. She had a small restaurant in the village in Brennan's village yeah. and her was cooking classes. So I worked with her for two years, kind of got my city chops a little bit, learned to navigate myself around there. Cause I could get lost in my bedroom. Um, so like, <laughs> I mean, how to like get on the subway and do all the things. So that was pretty cool. Um, and, I, and I kind of helped her run the cooking classes. So that was that was an awesome two years of my life. And from there, that's where I ended up at the um, my last place, the Harvest Restaurant Group. I started there in 2008 um, as a sous chef at the Huntley Tavern. And I worked there for a few years and kind of moved up to CDC, which is Chef de Cuisine. And then ended up as an executive chef in the restaurant group and moved around within their restaurants uh, of the group. That's great. So, so take me back to say, let's say 2016, you, you say, okay, I, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to, I have this idea for a business. How do you come up with that? This is even, a, how, how do you identify that this is even a viable business? You know, I didn't identify it. I more so identified with the fact that I needed to leave. So that was, kind of identified itself as something that I know that I could do and that I just needed to do. Yeah. So I needed to continue to work. And I know that I, I knew that I didn't want to work for anyone else ever again. Um, yeah. but, and if I ever did, it had to be like the perfect relationship and it had to make sense to my purpose and my passion. And I no longer wanted to just like punch this clock and, you know, do the thing. I'm a worker. I don't mind working hard or at all, but uh, the, the situation there just got to the point where I, I kind of realized that like, I no longer could be managed and not in a cocky, bad way. You know how you just kind of reach a ceiling in places yeah. and I, I had mine right. and it was no, longer, it kind of was like sucking the passion out of my soul. It no longer was something that I loved and I, and cooking is like my thing, like food and everything wrapped around it. People is truly, truly all I've ever done and all that I really ever loved. Um, so when I started to feel not so great anymore, I'm just like, I gotta go. Yeah. And when I left, I left kind of abruptly and it was more like, you know, Jesus was kind of just like telling me like, this is, it wasn't an emotional, I freaking hate this place. It wasn't like that. It was just like, you got to go now. So I did, I left now. It was very now. now. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't have a cushion. I didn't have a, anything, a whole line of savings or what am I going to do? So basically I was like, what am I good at? What can I do? And that's how, that's how the, the Tiny Onion Chef Services was born, like out of I don't want to say desperation, but just out of need, out of out of necessity. What, what, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. What's that, that old uh, saying invention is the mother uh, of necessity. Um, that yeah. That's pretty crazy actually to just leave and be like, okay, now I'm going to do this. Not, you know, a lot of times you hear people, they decide they're going to leave their quote unquote corporate job and they come up with a business plan and here's my idea. And this is what I'm going to do. You just peace. And then you're ready to go. I did. I did. And you know, it's not something that I would ever push anybody to do because it's not, it wasn't planned out. I didn't write a business plan. I mean, I have one now. I didn't have one then. I kind of just like everything kind of just fell into place and I was molding it along the way. And I'm really blessed. Like I, I leaned on my network heavily. I have some really awesome friends and really awesome physicians and everyone kind of just like, oh, I had clients like literally two days after I left. That's amazing. 
I, I got, I affiliated myself with like, you know, different trainers and a good friend of mine knew a trainer. He was like, Oh, call him. I called him. I had a client, you know, my brother is a trainer, a personal trainer. He gave me clients. Like we kind of all just like, it just worked. And um, yeah, that, so really that's an interesting, that regard. <laughs> yeah, that, for sure. That That's a really interesting th- world. So, you know, you, you do health and wellness consulting as part of Tiny Onion around. So I feel in the United States, one of the biggest, most misunderstood issues is food. You know, what's yeah. healthy for you? And it's such a fad, like everybody wants to lose their weight real quick. And then, you, you know, you sure have your fad diets, your keto, your you know, whole life, whole 30, what all those different things. How are you able to teach someone a that there's no sort of magic bullet for losing weight, and you have to put in the work and eat correctly. And this is the way to do it. It's not an easy thing. But it's something that I kind of just like keep the needle on, like, gently as much as I can, I say, you know, everywhere I can, I tell people to eat their veggies. I, you know, my thing is balance and kind of like, if you go cold turkey, just strip everything out of your life and try to go into this crazy diet, it, it gets overwhelming and you won't be able to maintain it. So I, I definitely walk it like I talk it. I, I am very open on all social media and kind of go through like what I eat, what I do um, exercise wise and things. But I just try to create healthier habits around food for people and just like kind of subbing things in. If I'm with my clients and I see them, you know, buying something and I'm like, mm, try this. Um, but it's usually like incrementally, like little things at a time. Cause I don't walk it. I certainly don't walk into the kitchen, like, Oh, take all of this out of your cabinet. You can't have it and sure. like, never sweet or don't ever have. So, um, I, I, I'm big on vegetables. I try to incorporate, even if you want to eat some junk, like just eat more vegetables. And then there's layers to that, you know? So, you know, maybe swap out some of your junky things for this stuff. But I think that if you eat a well-balanced nutrient dense meals, and then have some, you know, indulgences around that. I yeah. think it's a lot healthier than just trying to strip everything, no carbs, no bear, no dairy, no fat, no this, no that. If you have an intolerance, I get it. But if you think that your sexually marketed things of like fat-free, sugar-free, all that aren't laced with things you shouldn't be eating, like, you know, you've got another thing coming to you. So I just think like eat whole foods, eat, eat as healthy as possible. And then if you want to dabble in other things, then, then that's okay too. Yeah. So do you, eating the whole foods thing seems to be the only real way to have long-term uh, success no, with, no. with eating proper healthy. I agree. It is the only, it is the only way, whatever the keto, paleo, grain, I, feed, free, do a somersault, none of that. You can't keep that up. Like none of that is going to be sustained for a long period of time. And I know there's are some people that do it, but you know, scoop in the middle out of your bread and only eating the egg whites and all that. Like you know, it's just like, it, it just gets to be too much. So, um, and I think pressure that people put on themselves, it, it gets to be too much. For sure. Yeah. Do you have a least favorite diet that people come to you and say, I want to eat this way? Keto. Car- have you heard of carnivore? I haven't heard of carnivore. You know, I, I don't love keto um, because I don't think that people do it right anyway. And I think that it's alluring to people because they think it's some magical thing that you're going to you know, lose, strip all this weight so quickly and you can still eat bacon and cheese. Right. Um, I mean, it's like, you know, of course you're losing weight because you're, you're, you're cutting your calories. Like that's what all these diets are. It's just like, you're reducing calories. So the light bulb should go off. Like, it doesn't really matter. Like what the name of this magical diet is, is that you're not eating as much as you were. Um, so I would say maybe keto, I don't really like, and not that many people really do it right. And they definitely treat it like a get slim quick thing. And I'm not into that. Yeah. at all. Um, but I think all of them have a, a place, like if, if you do the keto for a month and that kind of kickstarts you into a healthier lifestyle, I'm cool. Like, you yeah. know, the, you know, the, you know, I know a lot of people that have to be grain free and all that. So I'm cool. not knocking anything specifically, but I don't like it as like the, as a quick fix. I like it if it's going to get you into healthier habits and a better lifestyle. It should be a lifestyle not a diet. That's a, that's a great way to put it. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. A lifestyle, not a diet. That's a great way to put yeah. it. So if you read any book about a successful CEO entrepreneur, most of the time they talk about two things. Number one, that they wake up early and, or they work out and really stay dedicated to some sort of a fitness schedule with your, with your business. How are you able to stay fit? 
Well, um, so in the, I wasn't always, um, I always wanted to be, but when I was heavy in the restaurant um, life uh, before 2012, I probably wasn't living my healthiest life. Yeah. I worked, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day. I would wake up just in time to get to work and then eat poorly. I fed everybody except for myself. And I would like hover in the corner eating bread or ice cream or something, and, <laughs> you know, cause it was easy and quick. And I also love ice cream and then, you know, come home and like, probably like, you know, binge on cereal. I ate a lot of cereal, ate a lot of junk and candy and um, then went to bed. Um, I'd say 2012, my lifestyle changed quite a bit. And um I gained some new friends and adapted my lifestyle and I incorporated healthier habits into my own life. And that's how I am now. So even when I was still in the restaurant, I, when I changed my hours, I worked from eight to eight. I woke up at four 30, was on the track by five and at work by eight. So I, yeah. I managed to fit it in. And when, let me tell you, Brian, when I added working out into my schedule, as if I didn't, wasn't already working enough or doing enough, I added, you know, 45 minutes of intense, you know, track work into my, and working out into my lifestyle. And I felt better yes. like better than I did when I would just wake up and go to work and go home and go to sleep. So, um, I, I think there's always a time and a place to fit it in, but it definitely added to my life now that yeah. I, and I, wake up early now I do wake up early I don't know if that's what makes me a successful entrepreneur or or you know the owner of my business but um it definitely made me just successful but overall and made me healthier and it, it kind of like get your mind ready to do anything like I yeah. even when working in the restaurant like I got beat up so hard in my training session that nothing at work it was just like I I can do it <laughs> you know you know so I, I think you're right I, I think a lot of times people um don't realize the mental benefits that exercise can give to you. So sometimes I really need it more for just like to get anxiety out. And, you know, I think that really, I do also find it interesting what you said that, it, and it seems kind of counterintuitive that you wake up at four 30 and then you go to a workout before work and yet you feel better and less tired. It's counterintuitive on, on the surface. Yes. And, but then scientifically, you know, the natural endorphins and all the things like it fuels you and, and you know, it, it definitely is proven that exercise makes your life better and yeah. harder for people to understand that but uh it definitely is true and it's added to my life so much so now it's like now that's a built-in habit i work out every day maybe yeah. i'll rest on sunday because even jesus did that but <laughs> <laughs> i typically i typically get some sort of movement in um and work out in every day that's great that's great well yeah I, one of the things that your business i find it, it can really help people is i feel like meal prep is a is a uh, is a life hack for a lot of people to eat healthy yet it's a really difficult thing to do on your own to figure out what you're going to eat all week. And then, you know, to sort of, so I actually subscribe to a, to a meal plan service as well. And I get 10 meals delivered to my house on a Monday and it helps. It's not. Yeah. Are they made? Know, they're prepared. They're prepared. Yeah. Oh, okay. um, so tell me a little bit about how your clients benefit from, you know, how you're able to help them with your, with your meal prep services. Yeah, so I do a lot of meal prep and it actually, you know, I have a lot of busy professionals, um, working parents, you know, entrepreneurs too. Um, and they, that is like a big thing for them, just like eating healthier when they're so busy. So I go in and I kind of set everything up for my meal prep service. I like to cook in bulk for them and give them an option to that, not to make the actual plates. Cause I think that's, that could get boring. So I don't do the containers, but I'll make like larger containers of like three to four healthier proteins, sure. three, days, three to four carbs, and then they'll make their own plates. Yeah. And having that already prepared for them, I, I chop up veggies for their salads. I kind of get things going for them. And I noticed that just like, even if I'm shopping or they're shopping on top of them, it like having the, the food ready for them, it, it helps them know like, oh, would Chef Lauren buy this or would Chef Lauren like this? Like even when they're shopping on their own, it kind of just helps them get on the track of like, even if they didn't bring their meal with them and they had to go buy a snack out, oh, and I'll get text messages like, is this good? Should I do this? So it's getting their mind going in the right direction. And even if they don't use me forever, I kind of kickstarted them into like the healthier lifestyle, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, no, I think that's that's a huge thing for especially busy people. So I have three kids, we're running around to practice. And when my son was playing baseball, there was a Wawa 
right by the oh. baseball field. <laughs> so that place became sort of like when you had no plan, that became the plan. And, you know, there's yes. only so many uh, things at Wawa that you can eat that are, you know, not horrible for you. So I feel like, you know, being able to grab a container to, to take with you to the baseball field or whatever is really a, a huge, it get, gets people's mind in the right, in the right frame, frame of mind. Yeah. Like you just have to have it ready for you. Like whether someone's doing it for you or you're doing it for yourself. Like if you're put, you, if you put yourself in a position where you don't have anything, you're going to make a not so fabulous choice because you're going to wait till you get so dang hungry and you are going to the Wawa or you're going to like McDonald's or something, whatever it is, that's quick. Or even if you're going into like the, the Wawa 7-Eleven and you're buying something like, you know, your mind goes right to like that sugary, dense carb because you're so hungry. You're like, I haven't eaten anything. So you're like eating the thing. So yeah, like having it ready for you is is definitely a step in the right direction. I pack my meals too. I do it for myself. Like when That's I go to my great. clients, I always lunch and I have it in between or sometimes I have it at their house, whatever works, but I do the same thing. <laughs> That's That's great. So I, we always talk a lot on this show about niches and how bi certain businesses reach a certain niche uh, and get really far into it. You have a very interesting niche that doesn't seem to have any, no one actually goes out to target that niche. So talk a little bit about the, the niche that, that Tiny Onion has, has created. Um, so are we talking about Fintwit a little bit? We are. We are or... into it. Yep. <laughs> So I am, yeah, like, um, so I have a very gr good friend of mine, uh, Tyrone Ross, and he's in the financial services, and um, he w is big on Twitter, and I didn't even, I had to Twitter, but I was never really, you know, I had like five followers, you know, and I was just like on there, but we're, we're very good friends, and he would always do these walk and talks, and one day I was on a walk with him, and he was on the walk and talks on live on Twitter, and he put the camera on me, and he mentioned my cookies. Now, I, I cook, I am a, a chef and I do baking on the side and I love to bake. It's like a passion of mine to do. Um, so I make these chocolate chip cookies and he said on Twitter live that like, I have the best cookies in the world. And he talked about me, he was always mentioning me on Twitter. And then I started getting more and more followers um, from the Fintwit space. And then I started doing like a couple podcasts. I have some the clients, they reach out to me to like cook for them. So I just became part of Fintwit and I am a chef, you know? Yeah. So um, they kind of deemed me Fintwit's favorite chef, which I thought was really cool, but it's such an awesome network of great people. Um, and, and I have more Fintwit followers than I have any other. Uh, I don't even know what chef Twitter is. Like there, yeah. I have so many financial services Um friends and, and followers on Twitter. So that, that's kind of the thing. But I think it's mainly because of, of him, my, a good friend of mine, Tyrone, and he has a big following and he always mentions me and he retweets my stuff. So they kind of all like fucked my way, but I had to keep soaking the fire. So he lit it for me. And now I had to like, you know, give them content that they like. So it's pretty cool that they're into it. Like, yeah. I love it. It's really so, cool. So, you know, just, just for anyone that doesn't know what FinTwit is, it's financial planners or financial advisors on Twitter that just talk about financial planning stuff and life in general. But to have Tyrone sort of be the tipping point for you is pretty cool. Yeah. yeah you know, you never know where, how it's going to happen. I mean, you're out for a walk with your friend and all of a sudden you have this weird, yeah. uh, this weird niche with all these people in the financial services space, which is how I met you, which, which is kind of yeah. interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put it out there on the podcast. Yeah, it's so it's really great. I mean, even yesterday, so I was on another podcast um, framework and I got, he sent like a swag box and I put it on on Twitter yesterday. I posted it and so many people were like commenting and liking it and it made me realize that it's just, it's such a cool space and it's just really cool that I had the opportunity to be there. And now yeah. I really am a part of the family. They just don't even look at it like I'm a chef. Like they tag me on things. They put me on the list and I'm like, yeah. I'm just, so I love it. It's really, really great. That's great. That is great. So since, you know, you're, you're friends with a bunch of financial planners, one of the things that, I, that, that we talk about a lot on this show is how when an entrepreneur starts a business, sometimes there's a financial goal in mind, like, hey, I want to make X amount of dollars or save X amount of dollars or whatever. But what they find as they go through it is that the financial side of things becomes in, not important, right? They get to that number and they go, okay, now, well, now what? So what, what's your sort of long-term focus or long-term plan or long-term goal for your business? And what do you want to see it become? Ooh, that's a good question. I didn't read that on the sheet. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say I am actually just like really happy with 
the way it's going. What, what I wanted, what I thought I wanted to, when I started was to open up the, the tiny onion, to open up the shop and that be my end goal. And that still might be like the very end, end like almost like kind of like a retirement thing. I think I really, I don't know that Chef Lauren is so scalable because I'm not, I, I sell myself. I'm not so sure that I want to have like too many people under me going into homes too. So I don't want to make it this big scalable business, but I do want to push the limits a little bit and maybe start traveling. Yeah. And before 2020, we talked about on Fintwit with all my favorite people. They're like, oh, come to where I am. Like come to Georgia, come to California. So I think I wanted to have a traveling year and go to like everybody's state and kind of do like a little stint where they are and have them like host, you know, meetups and Fintwit things and do like dinners and stuff. Um, so I definitely want to get some traveling in and go bigger uh, within my means. But as long as I can, like, you know, what what matters mo- most to me is my lifestyle and my happiness and my well-being. And that I'm staying healthy and happy and working from the inside out. And yeah. that's really the, the money part, you know, it's not I don't have like a big money goal in my head. I just want to be able to sustain myself happily, still be able to go to Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> really, you know, that's really where I splurge is, is Whole Foods. But uh, I just want to be able to, you know, c- keep creating my own schedule, keep meeting awesome people and keep doing what I love and not have anybody else dictate what that means for me. So that's yeah. really what my goal is. I love to hear that, you know, uh, to, to not have a financial goal and just to have your goal be to have the freedom to do exactly what you want to do and enjoy doing it, I think is such a huge and powerful thing for people. Um, I mean, I worked at a job like you where I hated my life every day. And I think (laughs) you said something like it sucked your soul. And I felt (laughs) every Sunday I would have panic attacks, have to wake up to go to work on Monday. So to be able to not ever have to feel that way again is really an underrated thing about owning a business. It's true. It really is. And, you know, it's kind of scares some people like, you know, some of the more old school people in my life or some of the, you know, the, the blue collar nine to fivers, which nothing wrong with that if that's what works for you whatever floats your boat it just stopped working for me and i yeah. never ever worked nine to five ever in my life so yeah. <laughs> your business more, doesn't allow that yeah no it was you know 12 <laughs> to 14 hours or, or you know scheduled for but you know it does scare some people because they almost feel like well when are you going to get a job and i'm like well i have one you know what i mean yeah. it's, like, it's 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 hard like to because i'm not at a place every single day from nine to five it's almost like i'm not working but um, I am, I'm always working, you know, this yeah. is work, you know, on social media is work, you know, g- getting people, you know, to know about your business and selling yourself. That's work every day. Yeah. There's something to do. So, um, but yeah, I love it. Yep. There's a Cypress Hill song called rock superstar. And I always quote the, the one line from it. And he says, it's a fun job, but it's still a job. You know, it's a, it's a, it, and I really feel that that can be a, a really good way to, to sort of set up a business. Yeah. Yeah. Is it? It's not, it's not easy. I mean, it seems easy for the people who, who, you know, are looking from the outside in, but I mean, there's kind of like, if I'm not working or I'm not creating some sort of value for myself, I'm not making any money. I don't, I don't have to have a job where like every week I'm getting this drip of money where I know I'm going to get it. There could, it fluctuates for me. So like that is a little in the beginning, I was like, Ooh, am I paying my rent this month or, you know, so it's scary, but like on the app, on the other side of that, it's also is really cool because like I said, I am in charge of my life and my schedule now, nobody else. So yep. it balances out. <laughs> I love, I love the control factor for sure. So I was looking at some of the pictures on your website and I, one, I'm not a sweets guy, but I happen to love a chip, witch. Yes. So that chip witch picture you have on your website. So tell me a little bit about that because it looked incredible. So like I said before, I love to bake. Um, even when I worked in the restaurant, I would come home at night and just bake. Like that was almost like my <laughs> like let go kind of thing. Like it wasn't like, you know, it felt like something I had to do, even though baking is more of a science and cooking and you have to follow recipes and you have to know and measure and do all the things. It was just such a release for me. And ever since a little girl, I've always done it. And my grandmother was a, a she's an amazing cook, but uh, also an amazing baker. And I have a few of her recipes and I just, maybe I think she sprinkles some goodness in me because I, that's where I love it so much, but I would come home and I would bake. And I decided to like, I was very fascinated with how chocolate chip cookies are different for everybody. Like yeah. you ever know everybody's mom makes a different chocolate chip so, cookie. Such a great point. Recipe on the back of the bag. Yeah. You know? <laughs> it's such a great point different everywhere. So I'm like, I'm, I want to make the best chocolate chip cookie ever. So 
And then I went through tons and tons of recipes, tons of bags of chips. And I kind of, what I think and what some other people think too is perfected. And I, I tweaked a little things here and there and kind of made a lot of recipes into one and my own. And um, everywhere I've gone, the clients, restaurants, anywhere, I make that cookie there. And at some of the restaurants, I even turn it into a chip, which I love ice cream. Like yeah. I love ice cream. <laughs> so I'm putting ice cream on anything and everything. Like if I if ice cream was the only thing that I could have, maybe aside from some gummies, I would choose it. But um, I do love cookies and chip witches are big for me. I try to turn any kind of cookie into a chip witch, but chocolate chip cookies with a really good vanilla ice cream inside is like pretty awesome to me. So yeah. that's it looked incredible. Did it have the sprinkles on the outside? It did. It had the okay. sprinkles. Yeah, it looked incredible. Yeah. You know, yeah, I, you, you, I work with, so I'm, uh, I'm not a millennial, I'm a Gen Xer, so, but I work with a lot of millennials and they always use the slogan, the phone eats first, which oh. I had to learn. So that means they always have to take a picture of their meal and put it somewhere. So I, I think about that all the time when I see pictures of phones. No, yes. my father-in-law is 75 and his entire Instagram is every meal he makes every night. And I'm not joking. Like it's literally every meal. That's awesome. I get yeah. it. Yeah. He's going into it. All right. <laughs> well, the last question, this is the most important question. Okay. <laughs> You're in Jersey, right? I, I guess that's central or North? I'm central. Yeah, okay. Central. So for those of you who don't know, my, my wife is from New Jersey, see. but it's important to know that New Jersey is broken into two states. It's North Jersey and South Jersey, right? Okay. Central sometimes, depending where you are, identifies as the North side and sometimes the, uh, it goes South. But there's a big division between whether you call it a sub or you call it a hoagie. The closer you get to Philadelphia, you call it a hoagie. So Lauren Owens, where do you stand on this important matter? I think I'm a sub girl. We, we are subs here. I worked in the sub shop. We call them subs. And I, I don't think I've ever gotten a hoagie. So yeah, I, I, call, we call it, I, I definitely am pro sub. Sure. Okay, good. We're, yeah. I'm definitely hoagie, but the one that really messes me up was like when they, I guess it's New York calls it a hero. Oh yeah. No, no heroes. I yeah, guess no. I'm a hoagie, but I, but we, in my area, and it's funny to me because like I said, I'm not, I'm not very good with directions. And for me, New Jersey is probably even smaller than the North and the South. And, and I call myself central because like in the touch to me is the middle. South Jersey to me is like Point Pleasant and North Jersey is like Montclair. So right. Like that, <laughs> I'm right in the middle of that. So central it is and we're subs over here. I love it. Well, <laughs> it was, this was awesome. So if, if people would like to know a little bit more about your business, where can they find it? So I'm at Chef Lauren Owens on everything. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And LinkedIn is just your name, Lauren Owens. And then um, you can get to my website for many of those. So the tinyonion.net, I am on, uh, I have a, a the website, but I'm definitely very active on all my social media. So you can find me on any of that and inbox me in any way or text. Love all it. My there, yeah. That's awesome. So, and if you want to connect with me on the untapped app where I rate these beers, my username is brcarney7. To learn more about how our firm helps business owners with their financial planning, visit riversedgeadvisors.com. And to hear past episodes of the podcast, go to happy-half-hour.com. Now, the moment of truth for Trogues, per usual, outstanding. I don't give beers five out of five often, so I'm going to give this a four out of five. It's outstanding. I really enjoyed it. Um, awesome. Lauren, thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed thank it. You. Yes, thank I you wish so you much, uh, much success awesome. and cheers to you. Same. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Happy Half Hour with an Entrepreneur, sponsored by Rivers Edge Advisors. For more information on how Rivers Edge Advisors can help you, visit their website at riversedgeadvisors.com. If you'd like to connect with Brian Carney for business advice or just to share a beer, Follow him on Instagram at Rivers Edge Advisors underscore LLC.